This is the Strike Mesh Boil Podcast, presented by the Merrimack Valley Homebrew Club. This week is part three on New England Pale Ales, and we've got PJ from Navigation Brewing in the virtual studio. That and more, so stay tuned. All right, welcome back to Strike Mash Boil. I'm Marco, president of Merrimack Valley Homebrew Club, and I'm joined by my co-host, Phil. This week, we will finish up our three-part series on New England Pale Ales. Then we will have the doc, Nick, back to judge a Czech pale lager. And lastly, PJ of Navigation Brewing will talk to us about how they got started and how COVID has changed things for small local breweries. So let's jump right into it with this week's edition of Hop It To Me, Part three of New England Pale Ales. Yeah, it's it's really technical and there's a lot of geeking out that can happen listening and, and learning about biotransformation. I think it's really important when it comes to personal opinion. Uh, I think it's really important when it comes to a New England IPA to get that real hazy character and hops and suspension and to pull out some of those really great characteristics. So I usually do a, a dry hop during biotransformation and then I'll do another one, a, a slightly smaller one, two three days most before I'm packaging. Uh, so what, what are you guys doing? Um, I'm on the same schedule as you. I, 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 I always put one in at high crowds and, and then I do a smaller one afterwards, just before, maybe two days before I'm ready to, to package. So I've been doing, my first charge is maybe 24 hours after pitching. So not at high crowds and maybe just yet, uh, working my way there. And then my second charge is usually maybe just past High Kraus, and so maybe at 72 hours uh, post pitch. And what I'm trying to do is I I don't have a unit tank, I don't have the ability to uh, CO2 purge everything, so I'm letting the yeast try and clean up any potential oxidation that could be induced by my dry hopping. So. I don't like tossing in any dry hops, you know, after fermentation is complete. I want I want that yeast in there cleaning up anything that I fuck up, basically. For me, I'm I'm still kind of skeptical on biotransformation. Um, you know, I've done it. I don't really know if I've noticed much of a difference. And I also only like to keep my beer on like my beers on the dry hop for about three days. So if I'm dry hopping at biotransformation and I'm fermenting a beer at 67 degrees or 66 degrees, but at the time it's done fermenting, it's already where I want it to be. But I'm not confident that all the, you know, diacetyl has been cleaned up, especially when you're using these English ale yeasts. So for me, I'm, I'm, I wait until I'm just about uh, at final gravity and, you know, say, uh, if the beer is at 10, 20, I'll, I'll dry up, start dry hopping then maybe 10, 10, 15, you know, six to 12 ounce, uh, dry hop in a five gallon patch. You know, if I'm, if I'm calling it double dry hopped, I'm going in that 12 ounce range. Uh, but generally it's six or eight ounces. So you're taking, you're, you're still taking advantage of some amount of biotransformation by having some of the fermentation happening while you're dry hopping it, just not as rigorous as doing it at high Krausen. But I, I think what we all could probably agree on is don't wait for your beer to completely finish and then start your dry hopping schedule. You want some of that fresh yeast character and and well, not yeast character you want some of that fresh yeast fermentation that's happening to to clean up some of the resi- there's there's some controversy in this but clean up some of the sugars that hops actually impart when you add them to oh yeah that is a real thing uh, so you do want your your fermentation to help you out there yeah i just experienced that with this most recent batch of uh new england pale ale. i call it an ipa but it would it would, it would fall under the pale ale category so i actually used the hornadol kvike yeast and i fermented at 95 degrees the beer fermented out so quickly that it was it was already at final gravity i decided to cool the beer to 65 degrees to dry hop and that was a terrible idea because it put one it put the the hornet all to sleep and then i threw in a massive dry hop of citra pellet and citra cryo and then i let it sit for about two, three days and i think on the second day i took a sample and it was the biggest green sweet cloyingly sweet hop flavor that i absolutely hate in beers and i thought i had ruined the batch completely but it was all from that the those sugars that are 
brought in by the hops. Uh, so in order to fix that, I warm the beer all the way back up to 80 degrees, you know, let it sit for about two days, took a sample and that flavor was gone. But it, yeah, that, that green dry hop flavor that you can taste in a beer, they didn't let the, the beer sit on those dry hops for long enough. Uh, the yeast either was put to sleep or it just didn't do its job by finishing it up. Yeah. And that's hop creep. And that's, if you ever taste those, those flavors, that's what it is, that green, sweet, cloying flavor. And I think my most recent batch of cluster and that was back in December, um, that some of you guys had, uh, had that problem. And I, I wasn't sure what it was. And, and now talking to Joe about this problem, I'm wondering, cause that was also a Hornadol yeast. I'm wondering if, uh, maybe I did the same thing and, uh, I should have heated it up when I added those hops. I think that's one other thing you, you should be aware of. If you're thinking your beer is maybe not hoppy enough or it doesn't have a, as much aroma as you want and you decide to dry hop in your keg, that could throw off those flavors big time where you're thinking you're going to pack a huge aroma by adding like two ounces of dry hops right into the keg and you get this cloyingly sweet green flavor. It could make the beer worse and something to that end too is there's the talk of is there a such thing as over hopping a beer personally i don't think there is i i don't think that you could if your process is correct i don't think you could over hop a beer i do think however there is a point of diminishing returns which means that there is a point when you get to when you're adding so many hops that you're not getting as much more out of it as you think you you are but i think if you want to experiment it you you should you can have fun and as long as your process is good you can avoid things like hop creep uh, and hop burn uh, but you know for those naysayers that say you're an idiot for doing that you're not it's fine to experiment uh, but just know uh, that from those of us that have done it uh, there is a point where you're probably not going to get you're going to spend a lot more money and, and a lot more time catering to the beer uh, then you're probably going to get out of it. And you're going to get less beer. Yes. Right. All those hops are going to hydrate up and they're going to take up a bunch of your beer. You're going to end up with less product at the the end. Totally. From my experience, that point of diminishing returns, at least in a dry hop, is probably around the 10 to 12 ounces. Any more than that, it's just, you're not going to notice a more aroma, flavor. You're just going to end up with a giant pile of hop sludge at, at the bottom of your fermenter. If you have... Uh, temperature control can cold crash it you might be able to pull a little bit more out of there but if you're trying to siphon that out and you're just doing that warm it is going to be an absolute mess and you're going to have probably like maybe four or five inches of hop sludge at the bottom of your fermenter if you let it sit long enough if you didn't compact it with you know a cold crash and please if you have not done cold crashing and you're going to put 12 ounces of hops in a dry hop please cold crash like you will save yourself so much aggravation, not just packaging it, uh, but you'll save. So if you're kegging beer and you're, and you're pulling side, it warm, yep. you want to talk about clogging a, a keg a thousand times, you will go insane. I've done it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've experienced it. It freaking sucks. P please cold crash. And for, if you don't know, cold crashing is literally taking your fermenter and bringing it to refrigerator temperatures for at least 24 hours to knock all the solids down to the bottom of your fermenter and then you siphon off the top. I've had that same problem, Marco, where you, you just clog the poppet of the keg. And uh, one thing I've done is I take the post apart on the keg, not so much to clean it, but I remove the spring and I remove the poppet. And then on the ball lock side, I remove the spring and the little plunger. So it's just a straight through and there's nothing to get caught on it. You know, some purists out there may say that I'm CO2 purged keg and all that mess is going to be impacted. But I, I mean, I've never oxidized in a New England IPA. I, I've had to, uh, I remember one time my clog was so bad and it was recurring so often that i eventually took the outpost off put a silicone hose on it into a bucket i let, I let the whole thing crash for a couple of days put this just jammed a silicone hose over it hooked up my gas and just fired off all the sludge at the bottom of the keg into a bucket to, <laughs> to unclog the thing and then it ran beautifully but there was just so much hop buildup that just sat on the bottom of the keg would have never I, there was times that i had to unscrew my my taps and they would just be this like blockage of hops uh because i use in the uh 
Perlix, the ball would just be stuck in just like hops. So it would just fucking nightmare. Uh, awesome. So if you don't have temperature control, I'd say one of the best things that I do uh, is if you can use your, like if you have a hop spider, a stainless steel hop spider, uh, say you're using a standard bucket fermenter, you can use that hop spider right into the fermenter and siphon through that. Uh, that that will be a really nice way of filtering it. Or if you have a very small hop spider, you can throw that uh, on the end of your uh, siphon tube into the keg. So you can you know you can filter in a couple ways, or you can throw a like a straining bag, a paint straining bag, or you know one of those Bruin Bruin bag bags over your fermenter before you dry hop, and then just kind of move the bag over when you're going to siphon uh, and that will make sure all your hop sediment stays in that bag it that is very i found that to be very successful uh for me when you're siphoning over making sure you don't get any of that hop sludge into your keg yeah uh some great tips i actually hadn't heard a couple of those before but when i used to brew I say used to because it's been so freaking long since I've done a collaboration brew. But when a few times the TJ and I have brewed together and we brew a really hoppy beer, we used to take we take a uh, hop bag and put it over your siphon, but then put a small piece of Tupperware inside the bag. Like so you put your siphon into the Tupperware with the hop bag around it. So it creates like a pocket at the bottom of the fermenter and you put it into the, your fermenter and, and siphon it out. And it works beautifully in a pinch for sure. One thing I would say is, you know, all these things just be incredibly careful about oxidation. Oxidation will kill your IPA in days. Yeah, there's no there's no style of beer more sensitive to oxygen than a New England IPA. Completely agree. And I I have ruined two batches by by having oxidation hit them. And I that's it. I, <laughs> yep. I know, he's, he's, he's doing better than us. Yeah. Well, I I mean the thing is is now now I only keg my New England IPAs and I do closed transfers because after that last one, I mean. If you've ever seen a gray beer, you know something's not right. And it, it just, it died in the keg and um, it had to be dumped out. And it's one of those things I've learned to avoid. And and you really do have to exercise care with these beers because of the, the hop oils and everything in there that's so susceptible to oxidation. And um, yeah, hard lessons to learn. If you're taking a gravity reading and your beer is straw colored or a light gold, and then your first pint pour is it's starting to go orange and over time it's starting to become more and more amber you've oxidized your beer on transfer i think that's probably the easiest way to tell is that color change over time and you know it's not you know i made it sound like it's going to happen within days and it does happen pretty quick as you would probably notice it on day two yeah i'd I'd say it's pretty it's pretty immediate but even a you know just a little bit of oxygen pickup is going to take a little bit more time in in but you will notice it and your flavors are going to dull. You're going to lose that aroma. You're going to lose that flavor. Whatever you can do to not oxidize your New England IPA, do it. Yeah, so th- there's a couple of things to think of. Again, uh, you know, if you're just entering into the homebrew world, uh, you likely don't have a bunch of fancy equipment to be doing closed transfer. So there's considerations that you want to be making when you're doing this. Consideration number one don't go into a secondary vessel. Do not add more splashing to the beer that's necessary. So do everything in your primary. Ferment, dry hop everything into the main vessel. But you want to consider what's going to happen. So before your beer is fermented, oxygen is good. Once fermentation has happened, oxygen is bad. So when you're thinking about moving around the New England IPA to do things like racking, transferring into a bottling bucket, transferring it into a keg, going into bottles, whatever it is that you're doing, you might want to consider where you're fermenting it. And where you're fermenting it may need to be the place that you're also going to rack from. So you're not lifting it up off the floor. You're not moving it across the room. Think about where you're going to put that fermenter so you're not disturbing it as much as possible. And then obviously when you're transferring it into whatever it is, if you go to into a bottle bucket before into bottles, if you're going right into kegs, uh, splashing, things like that are telltale signs of just how you're incorporating oxygen into the beer. We talk about closed transfers. Most of us are doing closed transfers, which is uh, basically forcing with CO2. Uh, you can do it with gravity also, but forcing with CO2 uh, to get 
it from one closed vessel into another closed vessel without the introduction of oxygen. But you want to just take some all the extra precautions with the New England anything, New England any kind of beer, to make sure that you are uh, limiting the amount of oxygen you get in there. I don't think you have to go Lodo. I know a bunch of guys, Lodo is low oxygen brewing. I don't think you have to do that, uh, but some folks live by it. But certainly post-fermentation, you got to take extra care. And I would be very careful with wanting to bottle uh, New England IPAs, bottling buckets and then going into bottles. And um, I've, I've never done it, but I have read and seen horror stories of beers that have just been an oxidized mess because they've been bottled. And, and folks are probably saying to themselves, well, I buy bottled New England IPAs, you know, all the time, or I've had them all the time. And that's because what folks are doing is they're carbonating in another vessel and they're using a CO2 purged instrument to be able to fill those bottles. So in the homebrew world, we'd use something like a beer gun, whether that's the Blickman beer gun that is preassembled or uh, something that you've made uh, to be able to do that where you're purging bottles and you're actually filling with a carbonated beverage already it's still not foolproof there are plenty yeah. of examples and plenty uh, often do people still have beers oxidized and i think the brewlosophy guys and i know you'd love to talk about this <laughs> phil uh, i think the brewlosophy guys in one of their uh experiments kind of shat on the whole oxidation thing because i think they determined that you weren't able to predict when oxidation would happen because they were measuring parts per million of oxygen in wort and were still not able to create oxygen oxygenation uh, or oxidation uh, so they uh i think they said that it's pretty random i think their conclusion was that it, oxidation was random which is pretty interesting actually because i've had you know full disclosure i've had some beers that i don't even know how did not become oxidized like i like i've splashed these things all over the fucking place between shit being clogged or stuck or bumping into things or you know a hose that was shorter than I thought it was going to be and it's just splashing all over the place and still ended up perfectly fine so it it is kind of weird sometimes, but most of us believe the less oxygen, the better. One thing I would like to touch upon is my recommendation is if you don't have the ability to do a close transfer and you, you're you just starting out, you're making, you, you know, say you've got, you know, seven gallon bucket or a carboy and you're making, you want to make new IPA, you, you can completely still do that. You do not need to do close transfer. Just transfer that beer when it's warm if you try to do a cold crash and then you do an open transfer that's when the i think the biggest risk of oxidation is going to occur is the oxygen can dissolve into a cold liquid way quicker than it can into a warm liquid so i've you know before i even had a glycol trailer i was making doing an ipa that was hazy unoxidized and beautiful and it was just coming out of a bucket and i wasn't doing cold crashes i started cold crashing in my bucket and that's when I started noticing, like, you know, I would do, you know, a CO2 purge. I would make sure that I wasn't getting sucked back. Well, if people don't know what suck back is, that's when you're cold crashing a beer. The volume, the density, the volume is, is shrinking because the liquid, the, like the temperature of the liquid is changing. You, you can say shrinkage, Joe. Yeah, shrinkage. <laughs> <laughs> it's shrinkage. So it's sucking oxygen into the vessel. So that's what another re way you kind of want to be be careful when you're cold crashing if you just have a fermenter with an airlock on it you throw it in your fridge in your you know garage or your basement you're going to suck oxygen right into the vessel so that's one thing to be careful of is if you have it say a fermenter and you don't have a co2 tank or you don't have a balloon uh filled with co2 a mylar balloon there's multiple ways to do it just don't cold crash it you can just transfer that beer warm uh, make sure you strain your hops and transfer to the keg. You won't have an oxidized mess. That cold side aeration or cold side oxidation is what you're going to be most concerned about. So say you cold crash, make sure your keg is completely purged. One thing you can do is purge your keg the day before, throw it in the spot that it's going to be in your kegerator and allow that CO2 to really drop to the bottom of the keg. Oxygen will go to the top keep on purging it before you do that close transfer. So I prefer the fill the keg entirely with sanitizer and then CO2 push all the sanitizer out of the keg. And so now, you know, your keg is 100% CO2 and there is no 
oxygen in there. And I've got enough kegs that I'll actually just daisy chain keg to keg to keg to keg and just run sanitizer from one keg to the next and, and CO2 purge them that way. Damn, that's why I wanted to do it. <laughs> that, that is one way of doing it. You fancy, Phil. Yep. I think that basically covers it, right? I mean, I think we've hit the, the whole gamut. I mean, if... If you listen to this episode, we've given you a bunch of different variations of how to do each one of the steps, different types of ingredients to use. You should be in a pretty good shape to knock out a New England pale ale. Uh, you know, for anybody who is listening to this and are thinking about diving into it, you should feel free uh, to reach out to us, whether it's uh, on social media or uh, I think we have a, an email address now, right? Or do we have an yeah, email address we, now? We do. Strikemashboil at mvhbc.com. Yeah. So you could even shoot us an email if you have questions. We're, we're happy to help you along with, uh, at, you know, what, whatever you're trying to do when it comes to a, a New England pale ale. And hopefully uh, you guys learned a little bit of something. I, I, I certainly enjoy talking about this today. Yeah, and if you do have questions and you post on, say, our uh, Instagram, myself, Joe, a couple of the other guys, we're all very active on Instagram, and we will see your posts on the Strike Mesh Boil page or on the uh, MVHBC page, and we will answer uh, your questions, whether it's myself or Joe or somebody else. So you can hit us up there on email or come into our Facebook group and you won't just get the four of us, but then you'll start getting Switzer and Nick, the rest of the cast of characters that you've heard on this show. We're all on that uh, Facebook group and we're all there every day. Yeah. That's the best place for anybody who's looking for info, go to the Facebook group because uh, you know, we're talking about new England pale ales now, but if you, you can just search information on our, on our Facebook page and uh, get a ton that we've talked about. Uh, and there's a lot of great info there. And we, always answer people's questions not necessarily me but you know folks in the group i don't think anything's ever gone unanswered or and we're happy to share opinions uh, you guys know from listening to the podcast that uh, we are full of opinions hey you know i just was i was looking over my notes we never mentioned what our og would be on a, a new england pale ale so what are we shooting for i i usually shoot for like 1045 10, oh, that's, 15, that maybe. seems low. Well, I like my I like my pale ales like four percent alcohol. Yeah, I, I was gonna say ten ten fifty six is probably the number ten fifty six to ten sixty for a pale ale. For a pale, I agree ale. with that. Right. Yeah, that, and that's IPA territory for me. No, it, once it gets to ten, once you get down to ten, 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 twelve, afterwards you're looking at a five percent beer. Yeah, my, mine's around the ten fifty two. Phil's gonna do the math. Yeah, Phil, I'm, I'm looking. I'm so I'm looking at Phil. Look at his phone right now to do the math. Ten forty eight to ten ten is five percent. I only know that off the top of my head because that's like the beer smith alcohol like calculator. It's the first thing that shows up. Go ahead, Phil. Let's hear it, buddy. Uh, let's see. So my my standard is ten forty five to ten ten. That's four point six alcohol. You were saying ten sixty uh, to ten ten twelve. Ten twelve. That's six point four. I think that's high for. Well, that uh, seems that that. Uh, hey, that's right in zombie dust territory. Yeah, I'll take it. That's good. I'll <laughs> think, roll with that. I think mine's in the in the five point eight percent. Yeah, uh, I would say five and a half to six percent. I think is the magic percentage for. Well, for, and uh, this is a perfect example of there is no one pale ale versus ipa de line of demarcation i think a pale ale should be under five percent you guys definitely run north of that well it's uh, just because well, you're well wrong. phil, you're phil wrong. It's, yeah. it's, it's because you're not making a new england pale ale you're making an old english pale ale no that's not true that's not true that, he nailed it nailed it he's well, uh, that's the, gl the glory about these things is it's all up to the brewery you can call it a double new england pale ale and it could be four percent alcohol like <laughs> phil's making a four and a half percent uh pale ale for phil it's an imperial english pale ale for phil that's what i was making. just drinking notch dog and pony show which i think is one of the best new england pale ales right on the side of the can that's also because it's notch it's four. also notch. Yeah, but it's uh four and a half percent alcohol the other one I was drinking during this was Four Seam from uh, Idle Hands, and that's six point six, but they call it an IPA. Yeah, I think above six, uh, you're you're going into single IPA category. Six to seven and a half percent above seven and a half, but you're going into double IPA category. My opinion, uh, but yeah, to me, four and a half is a little too low for a pale ale. I, I need I need a little bit more body in there, so I five don't know. and a half. Or six. I, that's what I bring to meetings all the time, and I never get that comment. So uh, yeah. 
Whatever. How many? How many? Award, how many awards is Cluster picking one? We're going off the rails now. Wow. How many awards has a has a IPA won in one of our club meetings in the last three years? Oh, in a long time. Yeah. A long so, time. I think the last one was actually at my house. I think it was uh was John John Drellick, uh at my house, like two three years ago in the summer. Uh, Luau might have won. Oh, Luau. Okay. Well, by default. Well, well, that was at Joe's house too. Yeah, that was was at my house. (laughs) All right, guys. Well, I this was great. I I appreciate us taking you guys taking the time to talk about it. I I can't wait for our next uh, conversation about how to brew beer. Uh, This one went probably longer than we were expecting it to. And so I I think that the future for these, you know, we'll we'll give us some feedback. Let us know what you think about this type of segment. We'll love to do more of them and talk about different beer styles with you guys. Uh, But Phil, Joe, Nick. Rick, Nick, fuck Rick. <laughs> I'll shave my head. I'm so, I'm, so, I'm so used to Nick. Uh, Phil, Joe, Rick, guys, this was awesome. Thanks. Appreciate the time. All Thank right. you. Take care. All right. Time again for this week's beer review. Each week, we're going to review a beer submitted to us by a member of the Merrimack Valley Homebrew Club or from one of our listeners. Our guest judge is going to walk through the judging process as if this were a homebrew competition. And all they know is the category of the beer, which this week is 3A. Czech Pale Lager. So joining us this week is the Doc, uh, our national recognized BJCP judge. Uh, Nick, welcome back. Good to be here. So we're doing another German pills. Uh, I think we no, did no. one. Czech pills. Czech pills. Oh, all right. So uh, I'm a pale, Czech pale lager. It's not even a pills. It's a Czech pale lager. All right. I'm all kinds of screwed up, apparently, yeah. right? So, you don't even uh, listen to my own intros, do you? <laughs> no, I was reading the guidelines. I'm making sure I'm prepared for this shit. You know, we uh, we I, I try to do a little bit of homework for these things. I try a little bit. Now, sometimes the homework is happening while the show is going on, which is a whole other thing. Uh, anyway, though. Uh, Nick, check pale lager. So this is the first one of these we're judging on the show, right? I believe so. Yeah, I don't think we've done anything like this. And to be quite honest, it's not a super common style as far as homebrew goes. I mean, obviously, we're all familiar with Pilsner or Kel, sort of the standard for Czech Pilsner, but that's actually a category 3B, which is premium Czech pale lager. I believe that's what it's called. So this is like maybe called a baby Pilsner Urquell. It's a lower ABV, but still has sort of those Pilsner Urquell characteristics. So pouring this right into the glass itself and the first smell, I get a bit of green apple, a bit of acetaldehyde on this one. It's not too bad, but it's definitely there. I also get some floral hops, which is to be expected. One of the common hallmarks for this style is, of course, the... The Bohemian Saz hops, which are very floral and spicy. And so I, I do get some of that in the nose. Um, I don't get much of the bready Pilsner malt, but that's also not a big flaw, especially since this beer is probably sub 4%. Do you guys get anything else as far as that goes? I think that's that's pretty much all I'm getting. Yeah, I think I think for me, you, you nailed it. I get a bit of the green apple. It, I think overall, the... The beer smells okay to me. Um, it, it's missing a couple of things, but I, you know, as you noted, I think that um, I don't pick up on like really significant flaws in the aroma. No, no diacetyl, um, which is the thing that I'm usually pretty sensitive about and pick up pretty quickly. And, and I, I don't really get any of that. The appearance itself, it's it's a great looking beer, pale golden, exactly what you kind of want for this style. It's a it's not crystal clear. It's a, it's a touch hazy it's not that bad but it it kind of indicates to me that maybe it wasn't lagered long enough and probably needs some additional time the taste itself again very clean malt a little bit of that green apple a little bit of acetaldehyde there's a really nice medium high bitterness in this some of that floral hop character is also coming through um sort of leading into the finish itself finish is quite dry I really like the hops in this one. I think it's pretty well balanced with the beer itself. Again, just that small note of acetaldehyde that can probably be addressed. It's it's missing a little bit of that Pilsner bready malt. It's, it's it tastes more like a like a clean kind of two row American two row. So I, I would like to see that. And there's certain tricks you can do to kind of amplify that. Either by adding maybe a touch of Munich, a uh, touch of melanoidin can also kind of amplify that maltiness. And that's something that. I would suggest at the end of the score sheet. Yeah, and you know it's funny. I'm I'm reading the guidelines here, and it's saying that it's saying diacetyl would be acceptable in uh, 
in this beer and I'm not getting any of it. So it's just kind of funny. Like when there are beers that you don't want it, you got it and beers you want it, you don't got it. Uh, but, but something I want to hear you talk to a little bit is how hard this style is to brew. Because when you sit here and say that a beer is like the smaller brother of a, a Czech pills, I mean, fuck a Czech pills can be really difficult to brew and then when you're actually taking away some of the some of the complexity, not even some of the complexity, but you're taking away some of the malt, you're making a lower ABV beer. You just got even you got in a beer that's almost got nothing to hide behind, even less to hide behind. Um, so talk a little bit about um, you know how difficult it is to brew, and, and maybe some tips if you're going to try to tackle this beer to make sure that you're paying attention to. Yeah, I mean, you nailed all the challenges. This is a very difficult beer to do. It's a lager, first of all. So you have to have the equipment and the know-how and be able to add enough yeast to produce a really quality lager without all the kind of flaws that can come with underpitching. In addition, it's, it's a smaller beer. Uh, it's, it's, it's not going to be supported and boosted by a, a big malt bill. So you really have to balance out the hops and the malt in, in that aspect. I guess I was, finally it's 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 a it's a it's a pale lager. There's if there are flaws. There's nothing you can hide it behind. It doesn't have a lot of hops. It doesn't have a lot of roast character that can hide a lot of those components. It's it's a big beacon on any kind of flaws that are going to be in your in your process. And so yeah, it's 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 exceedingly challenging to do this kind of style. Well, I was say going back to the one that we're we're trying. Um, keep you know knowing that it, how difficult this style is to brew. It's not. It's not bad. The flavor of it, I, I feel like, you know, what you described earlier, um, it's got some nice hoppy characters that are pretty good. I mean, it's a relatively thin beer, but it's supposed to be pretty thin. Uh, it's not. It's not bad. It's it's pretty good. It's it's pretty drinkable. I think the recipe is pretty spot on. I just think some of the techniques need to be addressed a bit. Yeah. I agree. But yeah, I, I I like the recipe. I think the balance between the hops and and the malt is is pretty solid. It's again. Just some minor things that need to be addressed. With all that being said, and by the way, if you're interested in the style, because there's not many breweries that do this kind of style. In fact, if you look at the BJCP guidelines, the example styles, they're all Czech beers you're never going to be able to find. But there is one that stands out that's here in New England, and that's Notch Session Pills. So if you really want to try this style, that's a really great beer. I think we've all had it. It's delicious. <sighs> so good. Um, yeah, it's great. So that that's a good kind of barometer to see whether or not you're on the right path towards this sort of style but overall i give this beer a 30 which is i think a, a really solid score it's yeah, um, it's in the good category yep uh, just sure, some, yeah. some minor minor fixes and uh, i think this would be a really excellent beer yeah and i gotta give a shout out to notch um and you know obviously they're not sponsors please be our sponsor we love notch uh and we'd love to do some stuff with you guys but uh if you're looking at anything in the european lager world those are the guys to go try their beers because like everything they're making in that category is a slam dunk for sure. Yeah, I was at uh, Redstone yesterday. Even though I'm doing a full dry January, uh, they had a uh, uh, Cernay Pivot, which is the uh, black uh, Czech black lager, and I grabbed a four pack of that because uh, Feb first. Uh, that's probably going to be one of the first beers I pour. Wait, you're doing a full? Uh, I, we're go I'm going to get a little distracted here. You're doing a full dry January. I am. I'm, I'm taking a couple sips of the beers uh, or the beer that we're judging right now, um, just to you know for for science for work. This I is work. I but could, I am doing a full uh, dry January. Phil, I could be mistaken. We're on video. No, nobody can see us but us. I think I saw the bottom of your glass pointing towards your ceiling a second ago. Uh, that is not just taking a couple of sips. That you just <laughs> chugged a glass a second ago. This, this is a uh, an eight ounce glass. It is not a full size glass, and I am not filling it. That's the next thing we're going to get into is the eight ounce can. But mark that down for a future episode, will you? Absolutely. All right. So a thirty, um, and again, uh, considering that this is a pretty difficult style of beer to to brew. So kudos to the brewer for. 
for attempting it. You know, we're, we we always look forward to these uh, not commonly brewed styles and, and having folks send them out to us. And, and at a judging table, uh, these are the styles of beer that don't get a lot of love, meaning there's not a ton of entries getting put into those categories. Uh, so it's always if you're thinking about how you can increase your chances in hitting a medal and getting into the best of show in a competition, choosing some of those fringe styles is a great way to do that because yeah, you're not stacking yourself up against against the New England IPA table, the American Stout table, uh, the Imperial Stout table. Like those are the categories that really blow up. So uh, kudos to this person for giving it a shot. Uh, 30 is a very respectable score. Nick, thanks for joining us again. Uh, We appreciate having you as always. Uh, We'll look forward to doing this again. If you like what you've been hearing on our show, hit that subscribe or follow button on your podcast service. And if you have any ideas or feedback for us, leave us a review or shoot us a DM on Instagram at StrikeMashBoil. Or join the conversation in our Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash MVHBC. All right, so joining us this week uh, to talk to our special guest, PJ, is Sean. Sean, welcome back to the show, bud. Hey, how's it going, guys? Uh, so we're we're talking this week to PJ Mercier from Navigation Brewing Company, old friend of ours. We've been uh, interacting with you for a long time, PJ. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Uh, so PJ, you've been in the brewing game for a little while now, and uh, you guys uh, had some pretty humble beginnings with Navigation and Lowell, and you guys have built quite the business for yourself. So let's uh, let's start from the beginning. You know, wh- how'd you guys get started? Um, it was actually all a joke how it got started. Um, my father-in-law um, brewed beer more than um, he did it at home, like any other home brewer. But he was more than your typical home brewer. He brewed for 25 years every single Sunday, um, and he brewed a lot of beer. And what he would do is occasionally he would have these big parties every year to get rid of bottles, and we'd invite everybody we know to go there, and we'd smash a lot of beer for him. Um, a lot of people sleeping on the lawn, on the pool shed anywhere they could find a place to sleep but then um what happened was we um we just decided that uh you know i I talked to him one day and said hey listen um why don't you ever sell this stuff so you brew really good beer it's better than just about anything i've ever had at a restaurant and you know why don't you try selling it and he had talked to me about it and again this we're going back you know we've been in business now for seven years it took us two years to get the business up and running um just finding space and all that stuff. So we're going back quite a ways where before, before the big boom. And um, he just, he decided uh, one day he wanted to try it. So we gave it a whirl and, and I told him I'd jump on board with them. And that was the end of it. Um, so it was just the two of you starting this thing off and you guys started off in basically like a w- garage warehouse um, in Lowell, but it, in sort of like a residential area of Lowell. It was, uh, you know, you weren't in this like prime real estate. You just decided let's open up a brewery in this little garage. Well, and there's yeah. a few garages there, but yeah, it was pretty cool. There's a few garages there, but uh, there was um, Enlightenment Nails. Ben Howe from Enlightenment Nails was already there set up. And uh, he was using it as a, a, a stopover from living out in Western Mass and working at, at the time he was working at uh, Cambridge Brewing Company. And uh, he decided he wanted to try, you know, dabbling his 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 uh, his toes in the water, and um, he did for quite some time, about probably about a year and a half. And then he got an opportunity to jump on board with the guys over at Idle Hands, so he uh, he jumped over there, and then then moved off to I think he like lived in Belgium for a little while, and then uh, out west, and then came back uh, came back. So you, guys, bit, you, you guys, you guys. We started with his spot. It was a tiny little garage bay, uh, 1,100 square feet. Uh, that's where I met Sean. Uh, Sean came down and sent us a, I don't know if it was an email or a Facebook message and said, hey, I'd like to help out. And I called him up and said, you know how to put a walk-in cooler together? <laughs> <laughs> and I figured, You're in. Like, but The answer was no, by the way. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay, it was no. But uh, he did show up anyway, and him and I um, – put a walk-in cooler, the first piece of equipment we had, you know, Ben had left everything there for us, but it was the first piece of equipment we brought in. And um, we were putting that together and drinking some of the old barrel age stuff that, that, uh, that um, Ben left behind. 
Well, that's, there's a gift. Uh, yeah, it was. So, <laughs> so I know Bob had been you. So Bob had been brewing for a long time. Uh, you were drinking beer, but you just des- you decided. I mean, not you guys were also. I think it's if I remember this correctly, you guys were still working your regular jobs on top of this when you started the brewery, right? Yeah, we we were working our regular jobs. Uh, Bob, well, at the time, what happened with Bob was he was working for the uh, railroad, and he ended up getting an opportunity to work like one day a week and consulting four days a week, essentially work from home job. So that's when he decided, hey, let's uh, let's let, you want to open up a brewery and. I said, Let, let's give it a whirl. Um, you know, like I said, we had been joking about it for years. Um, you know, I only had brewed a couple times with him, and it was more so to win over his his uh, respect or some sort for you know asking his wife to or his daughter to marry me. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, key to a man's heart, beer. It, yeah, I mean, it was a match made in heaven, really. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so you guys jump into business together. You're trying to build this new business. You're doing your other regular jobs. I mean, it must have been pretty challenging to begin with. Uh, very, very, very challenging. Um, you know, I I, I talk to a lot of guys that, that are coming up now uh, that are thinking about opening up a brewery. That they uh, they tend to come to me because I think they saw our humble beginnings and how small it was and. Bob being a home brewer, no, you know, a lot of these guys that are, you know, like just anybody, anybody that home brews, I think that's your dream of having a, a brewery someday. Uh, I think you'd be lying if you said it wasn't, but you know, and Bob had always had that dream, but you know, we, uh, it is tough. It, it's, it's hard. It's a hard thing to do. It's not easy. You got to be prepared to work and you have to be prepared for no sleep. It's like, it, it would be like having, I don't know, baby twins you know, the first time and you're 25 years old and you don't know what the heck you're doing. Uh, it's just, it's crazy. It's a wild, wild ride. Just got to be prepared for it. Yeah. And I, I know uh, Bob was doing most of the brewing at the brewery, but eventually you started doing brewing for the brewery. You weren't just a lackey there. You were actually doing some work. Yeah, no, busting, busting hump. I started off with pretty much just starting with doing the marketing and then the sales, getting accounts, getting all the licensing, uh, you know, helping out with that. And I really did not know when I was going to, when I first started, what my role was going to be, you know, everybody thinks, you know, you own a brewery, they're like, you know, and then they come and look at it and they're like, they, they think of something on the lines of like a Sam Adams, you know, they think all thank you, Jim cook. Um, and then they show up and, you know, it's this little rinky dink operation. So I really did not know what I was doing other than to assist Bob in anything he needed me to do. And mine was just, it was literally learning as I went. And then if I been just reading up on stuff, you know, you get searching the internet for anything I could find on how to better condition the beers, how, you know, uh, it was mostly Solomon work that I was doing and then, So it was, it was a lot of, uh, it was a lot of learning on the job, but you know, I had Bob there who's been doing it again for like 25 years at this point. So he, he walked me through everything. And then I just started sort of taking over the role of just about everything. Um, you know, minus the, uh, the brewing itself, I was there to assist, but Bob was, you know, Bob was putting the recipes together and everything else. Um, and he still continues to do that. Um, you know, I'll, I'll be here brewing with him. You know, I have a little bit of, there's a little bit of stuff I I put into the beer, Um, you know, just suggestions and other things like that and letting Bob know what's trending or, you know, you know, what, what, what the, uh, what's selling the best or anything like that. Yeah. uh, You know, I, because I, I remember your location vividly. It wasn't that far from my mom's place. So it was easy for me to swing by and, and grab some beers. Um, and and I have to imagine when you're in, you know, a small startup brewery doing, that was essentially a barrel, right? You guys were brewing in a one barrel system at that time. It was a barrel and a half, right, Sean? Was it yeah. A oh yeah. 45 gallons. Yeah. That's, a, that's, a, that's, that, that sounds right. Uh, so when I, when I think about that, uh, there's gotta be moments like you're putting it all on the line, you're opening this business, you're thinking about leaving your jobs. There's gotta be moments you're saying like, God damn it. We made a terrible mistake. And then to where you guys are today, there's a point where the light bulb goes off and says, hey, we've really got something here and it's it's working really well. But can you talk a little bit about the ups and downs? Because I think what people don't realize is when we're home brewers and we're getting really positive feedback or we're doing well in competitions, we're often 
really confident <laughs> that we can jump into the beer game and be really successful because we've got that one recipe that kicks ass or we're getting all this really great feedback, but it's not all sunshine and rainbows. I mean, you, you talked about how busting your ass, but there's gotta be those points where you're like, I don't know if we're going to make it. Um, for us, it, for us, it was always, it always started, it started small and it was, it wasn't so much that we weren't going to make it. We, we, we saw that at the time we got in, there was just about the start of the boom. So night shift had been in business for a year. Trillium's been in business for a year. Um, who else was there? There was Jack's Abbey was a couple of years ahead of us. So there was a start where those guys really came in. They went, you know, well, minus night shift, they started pretty small too. But, um, but by the time we got it operational, I think those guys had already moved so they, a lot of these guys got big really quick and we sort of snuck in where there was, wasn't many small breweries in the area we were in Merrimack Valley, even towards Boston, there weren't many small, small breweries. Everybody had gone to like, you know, they were like 10 barrel or 20 barrel systems. We were super small. So we were bringing in people that really wanted that small, you know, the small, almost like they want to know they want to know who runs the place they want to they want to see it from the beginning so back to the whole you know we we kind of we grew very quick so we didn't have that problem um you know we weren't fighting for shelf space at the time there wasn't a lot of guys on the shelf it, it was it was a handful of, it was a handful of people on the shelf and then you had all your big craft beers like Sierra Nevadas, um, Lagunitas, you know, you had, you had these beers that were there, but people had already had them for a couple of years now and they were looking for something new. So we were able to sneak into, you know, uh, a, a few uh, restaurants and a few niche craft beer stores that allowed us to kind of create a buzz about, you know, who, this new beer, pro, this new beer coming out, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of the, there was the other people that were around. Um, it was, it was right before that boom. So the others, you know, they were in Worcester, so we weren't fighting for the same space. And Merrimack uh, Ales didn't come to, they were right down the road from you guys, but they didn't come till a year or so after you guys. Yeah. I want to say they're two or three years behind us. Yeah. Um, I, that's what I want to think. I think it's like, it, it might be two I, years. Could be three years. I think it was two because we, we were directly involved with helping lead them to the area of Lowell. And, yeah. yeah. And that, and that was while we were still on Meadowcroft Street. Yeah, because we had I had directed him to go check out the space. He was looking for something bigger at the time. He was looking to put in a, a production brewery. Again, we were a barrel and a half thing. He I think he was putting a ten I think he would ten, but, yeah. Yeah, fifteen barrel system. He was go he was looking to put in. So a lot of the places I looked at that were too big for us, I had given him and said, "Hey, you know, you might want to check out these places." One of them was being his current location. Now um, we had looked at that space early on, although it was a different part of the building. Um, but again, we we just we were just shopping around. I forgot what the question was. Now. Yeah. So so you guys um, from. Basically, you know, you, you have this humble beginning. You were in that location for, was it three years? No, no, no. We were, we were there for exactly a year. Wait, in the garage? We were exactly yeah. a year in the garage, yep. God, we, if, I thought it was longer than that. Okay. Uh, so you're there for one year. So then, all right. So then that was, speaks. To by the time we got over, we got, by the time we got everything over. So we had still, we had brewed a bunch of beer and everything else. So we, we had the supply where we were still delivering the beer and everything else. We were waiting for one space to finish while the other one was leaving. Yeah. So you guys find the, this new location and it's your home today. So you guys have been there now for five, six years, if my math yeah. is right. Yeah. <laughs> if, I, if I can do seven minus one, I think it's six. Uh, so you guys are in that the the new location, and I still, you know, I I gotta say that you talked about being a small brewery and people wanting to get to know the owners. Even though your location's a little bit larger, your footprint's bigger, you've got more people there. You still have that vibe when you go into navigation. Like I, you you guys are there, you're present, you can interact with you guys and get to know you guys. Even though the brewery's gotten a little bit bigger. Yeah, we try we try to stick around, you know, as much as we can if we can get in there. I try to put myself, um, you know pre-pandemic stuff i tried to, i was on the taps at least once a night if not twice a night just filling in or helping out and then 
we i'm trying to think what yeah we 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 still have that vibe um that you know that that's that the owners are around the people around but we have got guys like sean who've been here forever um mike um you know we these guys know the business just as much as i do you know that they're around i mean crying a lot they got keys to the place you know they, they that's pretty cool when you can go around and tell people you got a key to a brewery. I mean, <laughs> that's pretty neat. You got so you got some balls giving Sean a key to anything. You kidding me? <laughs> I trust that boy with my. I trust that boy with everything. That's great. Uh, so you guys, um, uh, what, what do you what? Because last time you and I talked beer, uh, it's been it's been a while now, but uh, you were still brewing on the barrel and a half system. You guys had got that new sort of brew in a bag system that you guys were playing around with. So I don't know what you guys have. And, and I don't think you're using that anymore. You did that. I sounded like it didn't go so hot. Uh, what are you guys brewing on now? So now we're brewing on a uh, forge kettle work, seven barrel system that uh, we purchased from Riverwalk. They, they had, uh, when they had moved to their new location, this was the one that they had in their, their small location. They moved over, and I think they went to a 30-barrel, and they kept this one to do some small projects on and stuff like that. And we were happened to be looking for one, uh, so we had called up Forge Kettle Works and asked, hey, anybody in the area have one? And he's like, Riverwalk has one. They're not too far from you guys. We went up there and said, hey, we want to just check out your system. And, and um, then uh, we went home, went to go push the button on the um, on, on buying a whole new system, and uh, – Literally got a, a phone call from uh, from Steve over at Riverwalk like about oh, ten minutes before saying, "Hey, uh, I might want to sell my system if you guys are interested." So we just told him. I said, "Name your price." I didn't even argue with it. I just didn't even try bothering back and forth. I just said, "We'll take it," and we we set it up and we went we went rolling with that. The problem we had in between was we were brewing on that barrel half system. We we were doing double batches, and then we brought this this uh i don't want to knock on the you know what actually i think they're out of business right now and i wouldn't be the best. colorado brewing systems we brought this like brew in the it was like a bag kit type thing it was a stainless steel mesh it was the mash tongue goes in we tried yeah. brewing twice on the thing and i don't even we don't even know what the hell happened we couldn't How get big the, was it? it was pretty big it was it was basically two barrel kettles so it was a it was their dual four barrel system yeah. Yeah. So it was four. It was two two barrel kettles side yep. by side, and yeah. each one had its own basket that you. It was basically a brew in a basket type system. It's a glorified hot water tank right now. Don't, don't oh, so you're still you're still using it to heat water. Well, that's what, all we use it for is a hot liquor tank. Bob can control the uh, the, the he can control all the, uh, the the water quality better that way at a smaller dose. So we essentially use it for our spodge. Um, you know, we'll heat we'll heat our mash water up in the kettle still because it's just it's it's cheaper to run the gas than it is the electric um and then what we'll do is we'll just put our sparge water into the, those uh those two two barrel tanks and and then we go from there so heat those up. like it's a brew in a bag i can't even imagine or brew in a basket can't even imagine like the winch system that you need to lift you know <laughs> all that grain all that water i've got a 20 gallon <laughs> basket set up for spike uh, spike kettle and i've got like a, a multi-pulley thing in the ceiling of my basement to get that basket out of the damn kettle so if i remember correctly these are electric hoists it would that, have to be that that pull these things up and basically as you pull it out of the kettle it tips it forward and you better have a barrel there ready to catch it wait what like yeah, to it, catch the grain yeah. As it's lifting up, the basket's tilting. No, no, forward. no, no. You lift it up and as you're it's it's got a trolley that goes forward. So as you're pulling the basket to you, it doesn't I don't know if it completely removes from the kettle. And as you're pulling it to you, it starts the tipping process. Oh wow. Interesting. It was the only, pro only problem was just the the wench they gave us was not uh, not up to grade. <laughs> <laughs> it was nasty. It it's a great it's, it's a great hot liquor tank yeah it sounds like it's serving its purpose it's, it's it's got it's got flow control so you can tell it you want 100 gallons i'm just throwing out arbitrary numbers but you just tell it you want 100 gallons it pumps in 100 gallons starts heating it to the set point that you set it at so it, it works it does what it's supposed to do but it was just completely different from what we've ever brewed with in the past yeah i gotta tell you i'm pretty impressed though um 
you know, going to navigation, I, it, it's, uh, I mean, it's, I was the last time I was there was 2020. So admittedly it's been a few months since I've been there, but uh, that you guys actually got that seven barrel system and fermenters and everything set up in your space. And it still feels great in there. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's the vibe that's here. The people that come here are awesome. Um, you know, we've built a community, we've got a lot of regulars, but then we have a lot of people that are just, you know, hopping around and want to hang out. Um, we're starting to see, you know, we're starting to see, you know, more people come back with COVID, uh, from the COVID, you know, more and more people are coming. Um, but you know, pre COVID, uh, we were starting to get, it was starting to be more of it before it would be like 50, 50, you know, 50% regulars, 50%, you know, new people. Now it's that number has grown. The, the people that are the new people that are coming in, um, that, that number jumped up big time right before COVID. Yeah, and so I, we're, some would say that we're sort of in the middle of this sort of industry correction, we'll call it, uh, where uh, the, the still breweries opening all over the place really fast. The, the industry is still growing, but it's not growing at the same rate it was before. And we're seeing, we've seen some uh, businesses shut down either due to the pandemic, the impacts of uh, the pandemic. <laughs> you guys seem to have a little bit of a different impact from the pandemic. I mean, it might've been challenging with government regulation in the beginning, but you guys got pretty savvy, adapted your business and have made it out pretty good. Right. Um, yeah, we did. We, we were, we were all lined up. We, you know, we, we stock up on stuff and uh, we, we were able to, when the, when the pandemic hit, we already had an order of cans, you know, a large order. Cause we, before we would only can around the holidays um, and what we would do is, you know, make it sort of a special release. It's, it's, you know, limited stuff. Um, only a handful of beers were, were being canned. And, um, so we had a stockpile of, of cans and when we, when the, when the pandemic hit, and as soon as we got word that we could still, you know, be open for, to go stuff, everything went in a can and we were just ready to go for it. Um, it was a long, you know, tedious process, but, um, a lot of work but you have to do it and you know you just we were set up differently we were in a production place we didn't have our beer we weren't worried about putting our beer in stores we weren't you know that weren't sure if they were going to be closed down we were in, we were not we had nothing going to bars or restaurants um everything it was in-house so for us we we didn't you know a lot of places lost that you know they they had they were producing all this beer that that's you know, predicted to go somewhere. And then now they're sitting on it and they had nowhere to go with it. I mean, I crown, if I remember right, I think even people were donating beer for it to make like Santa. Yeah. The, 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 for just, distilling for Santa. Yeah. yeah. The and whole it, NHC did that. Y- yeah. And then they got a $14,000 bill afterwards. I, I, whoa. Glad we didn't do sanitizer. <laughs> um, I think the government fixed that, but uh, yeah. No, yeah. Uh, you know, there was a lot. So a lot of those guys, again, I think that's a product. If anything has taught us, you know, if this thing has taught us anything, you know, growing fast is not necessarily always good because you never know what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, and I, I think that some correction stuff come in. I think some, I think a lot of these other brewery, a lot of other breweries are going to, I think they're going to dial back down. They're going to go back to almost like their roots of being a community-based place and slowly putting stuff back out. Um, that would be my prediction. I think that's the safest conservative bet. And I think those are the people, the people that are, are doing things, you know, on a smaller scale, I think are going to be better off in the long run. You know, the, the bills are less. You don't have a hundred employees that you have to worry about. You know, we, you don't have, you know, thousands upon thousands of accounts. Um, you know, that, that beer that's destined to go somewhere, you know, the, dis, the distributor still wants the beer or wants you to produce that beer, but you may not sell it all. And it's going to, you know, it's, it, it was tough for a lot of people. We'll see, we're going to see what happens in the end. I don't think this is over yet. I think we're going to start seeing the repercussions, you know, uh, by the end of the summer. Um, I think we're going to start seeing some more closures. Some of these other guys going out of business. Uh, it's sad to say, but, I, you know, I, I just think some of them are too big for, they just, they, you know, they just, they got too big too quick. Yeah. I mean, and 
in some of these markets, like, you know, we were talking before we actually hit the record button, we were talking a little bit about real estate and I was sharing that, you know, some markets are going to bounce back just fine. And if the business isn't keeping up with it, you know, rent's going to come due, mortgage is going to come due. And uh, if you're not able to, you know, keep your head above water, that's when things get a, a little bit more challenging. So now, when, you, when you were saying about kind of going to that hyper local mentality of, you know, dialing it back, I think one part of the pandemic that has shown um, maybe a, a concern for the beer industry or the brewing industry is there was a real push to go to a tap room only model where, um, <clears throat> breweries weren't doing any distribution whatsoever. They weren't doing any packaging at all, except for maybe growler fills. And then all of a sudden the pandemic hits, you've got to shut down your tap rooms. You've got to do to go sales only. You guys were kind of set up for it, like you said, and um, you were able to pivot very quickly. There are a lot of breweries that weren't able to pivot very quickly and canning lines are relatively long lead time. Even say the October can seamers that are out there, those were becoming long lead time. So do you see, you know, pivoting back to just a, that hyper local tap room model, but maybe with a, a substantial portion of the product still being a to go that's, do you see that as kind of where things might go? I'm leading the witness with my question, I'm sure, but do you see kind of that's where it's going to go? Yeah, I, I, I think that, yeah, I think that's where it's going. And that's essentially what we're doing. So, uh, you know, we're just, we're doing, we're doing a lot more canning now because we realized that we had a whole group of people that were coming in when the, when the, we, we learned from this but big time. We did learn a lot. We, and, and it was good for us because, you know, we weren't, we were a tap room only brewery with occasional canning, but then found out when you put everything in a can, there was, you know, me being the owner, when this pandemic first hit, it was Bob, myself, and one of my kids work in the register and we would be open for like three hours. Everything was canned and we, they would come in, you know, Tuesday, third, I think we did. I think we were just doing Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Sean was there sometimes too. He would come in. Um, and we saw a whole new group of people that came in to buy beer that weren't particularly people that are going to come to the tap room. Um, you know, they wanted the beer, they wanted to come down. They don't want to come to the tap room and have it. They wanted the, the beer to go. And, and um, so, you know, when everything gets shifted to that, you're seeing a whole ton of new faces. And then, so we realize now, it, all right, we just got to keep a balance between that. Is it going to be, you know, 75% of the tap room, but then 25% going into the cans? Um, you know, I don't really, really count the growlers because, you know, not for nothing, but being in the brewing industry, I can tell you right now, crowd growlers suck. They're just horrible. Um, you know, it, it's, it, it, you got a million of them. <laughs> you just, it, they just, they're horrible. They stink to fill. It's really bad for the beer. Um, it's, you know, it, people just don't know how to clean them. And when they bring in them back, you have to, you know, you got to clean them. And it, it's just a pain. Um, but no, I do see that's the way the industry going. And I, and I honestly think that that's, you know, if you look out, out west in California, no, those guys have been doing it for a long time out there, and that's mostly their models. You know, there's a ton of breweries out in California, and, and that's what they do. They have awesome tap rooms, great vibes, destination places, and then they have a they have a to go, you know, a to go package. You know, you could buy whatever you whatever they have available. Um, it's limited. It's you know, um, it. I, I think that's the best model, in my opinion. That's all the time we have this week. Next week, PJ will be back in the virtual studio to finish talking to us about navigation and what's next for them in a post-COVID world. We'll also have Carl and Switzer back to talk about how you can get started aging beer in used barrels. And Mr. Matt Savage is back on the show to judge the first IPA anyone has sent in to us. It took 19 freaking shows to get an IPA. Anyway, that's what's up next week here on Strike Mash Boil. The Strike Mash Boil podcast is produced by the Merrimack Valley Homebrew Club, an AHA sanctioned club. Follow us on Instagram at Strike Mash Boil. 
Join the conversation in our Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash MVHBC, or send us some feedback at strikemashboil at mvhbc.com. Thank you.